We are in Champions League, man. That was my Dilly din, dilly dong, come on. Ancara Messi, 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 Ancara Mess
content. I, I don't know if they understood me, but uh, they always uh, stayed out of my way when I was coming to the ball. <laughs> We're obviously in, in coach coach education, coaching community. There's so much now about getting the information and delivering it in a really clear and precise way. You you yeah. mentioned there about the the passion. It's something that I, I talked to a coach last week about where we talked about charisma and how great managers can make an impact on a room just by their, yeah. their presence. You've worked with some of the best. Was that passion there on a daily basis? Was it was it every so often? How how do you, how does that charisma work, I suppose? Yeah, I think I think it, uh, Gary, what it is, like I've as I said before, I've been at a few clubs, but every every manager was different. Every every manager had their own had their own ideas. But uh, the biggest impact I felt when I first went to Manchester United, uh, the, the way Sir Alex Ferguson worked was uh, very interesting because clubs always was before the managers used to coach on the training pitch. But Sir Alex Ferguson, he just walked around and talked to the players, and he was like a father figure to me. Actually, you know what I mean? When I was growing up, uh, I was only 23 when I moved to United, and uh, when he walked in the room, see when you walk in the room in some clubs, everybody's still talking, but when he walked in the room, everybody kept quiet and, and wanted to listen to what he had to say, and, and I, I, I can still remember that when you come in at half time and uh, the boys are talking, next minute Sir Alex Ferguson comes in and uh, everybody just keeps quiet because the respect the players give to Sir Alex Ferguson, it was one of those respects from the players and the manager. The manager gave players respect as well, which was excellent. But mm. like as I said before, Val, there's a there, Barcelona, he was uh, when he was uh, at the August and he moved on to back to Spain and went to the manager of Barcelona. It was one of those situations that was difficult to him because he took the coaching, which was uh, excellent coaching. He was it was short, forty five minutes maybe on the training pitch and it was really intense and, and quick and sharp and uh, he, he, his English wasn't the best, so it was different at that point of view. But he still tried to uh, uh, talk to me and try and keep, make me feel welcome at the club, which was I thought was brilliant. You know what I mean? And then you have uh, all the managers when I was growing up. Uh, Old City and uh, Wigan it was completely different. You know what I mean? They were all shouting match, and uh, but that made me a stronger person as well because you're going to get shouted at in the game. Supporters are going to be shouting at uh, goalkeepers. We're the closest to the, to the fans, and I'm trying to say to the young goalkeepers this day and age now, I says, if the fans are not shouting and screaming at you and giving you a bit of abuse, it must be you're having a bad game because they don't have to put you off. And, I, and that's what I always say. So if they're all having a go at you, you know you're having a good game. So that's that's what they're, they're trying to put into these young keepers to take each thing as it comes. And that's what I want to try and do. Is I, I might not become a manager, I might not become an a outfit coach or whatever, but I want to give this to the young goalkeepers of Northern Ireland and wherever else I go to in the world. Is like everybody's different, and, uh, different opinions and different uh, ideas. So one coach might not speak to you, but another coach will speak to you. So that's just where football is. But I have this argument all the time with the goalkeeper coach in Chicago. Yes. What makes a great goalkeeper coach? You're arguing with a goalkeeper coach. <laughs> Something wrong with the Irish, I tell you. I was the same. I'm the same. No, uh, what makes a good goalkeeper coach? Understand the player. You have to understand players. You have to understand the goalkeeper. You know what I mean? Uh, every 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 kid, every goalkeeper keeper you train is different. You have to you have to have an open mind, and, and uh, that's what I think to be a go- become a goalkeeper goalkeeping coach. And of course, you need energy because you need to give energy to the keepers as well. Because the goalkeeping coach in Greece, some days I used to come in, I'm tired, and I need a bit of energy, and he got me. He got me going. He got me motivated in five or ten minutes of the training session. And, I, and at the end of the training session, I felt really, really good because it happens. It, sometimes you can't give 100%, but you need a coach that can get you motivated. And uh, I was lucky enough, I had good coaches around me who got me motivated. And sometimes people say, you've got to be motivated because it's a job what you do, you can get paid for it, what you love doing. Sometimes uh, you, it, you, need a, you need a kick up the backside. And, and that's what I feel like as a coach. I'm just starting out to be a coach, and, uh, and my belief is you can coach, but don't coach too much because uh, the kids have to learn themselves as well. That's the way forward. Because if you coach, 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 how are they ever going to learn themselves? You know what I mean? That's the big, the biggest, the biggest aim in life. You have to learn yourself, and that's the way I had to learn because I never had a goalkeeping coach until I went to a full-time goalkeeping coach until I went to Manchester United, and I was watching videos. I was watching the first team goalkeeping. Playing and watching what they were doing, and I, I, 
coach myself a little bit at the start of my career. So uh, it's just different opinions. Everybody's got different opinions in the game, but at the end of the day, you want the best from your goalkeeper and uh, you try and work with your goalkeeper and you have to have a friendship with them as well. And you can go into depths and you can go in and you can keep talking about goalkeeper, what's, what makes the best goalkeeping coach. The best goalkeeping coaches is like uh, you do your sessions during the week and you prepare your keeper the right way. And if he keeps a clean sheet, that's, that's the best goalkeeping coach you have. Right. <laughs> simple um simple man <laughs> the when yeah so the, this role of having the player be a bit more responsible because we're now approaching a time where there's so much information that you can give people can you, you know, what, what was your role on a match day or half time what did you want from the goalkeeper coach uh, like what you just said there you hit the nail on the head gary was um end of my career i was getting more videos sent through by email by my uh goalkeeping coaches and stuff like that probably in my last six seven years of my career especially in Northern Ireland uh, when we're doing penalties and stuff like that there uh, I've probably saved more penalties in my career in my last six seven years than in my whole career because we never had that opportunity to get videos because now you can you can pop online you can get every probably nearly every game in the world online you know what I mean you can watch keep you can watch penalty tables and stuff but for me uh, uh, for me when I was prepared for games was I just concentrate what I was going to be doing on the pitch because in them days, uh, especially in the lower leagues in England, I was playing, when I first went over the whole city, I was 17 years old and we never had the, the opportunity what we have now to find out what, what type of players we're playing against until you end up playing against them and then you keep that in your mind the next time you play against them. But uh, my preparing for the game was uh, focus, work hard in training because I'm a type of guy who if I don't work hard in training I'm, I'm preparing the wrong way. I will go into my game as well. So I learned in a young age that I have to work hard every time I work in the training session to prepare in the right way for a game. And that's, that's the way I used to prepare. But now, like I said before, the last five or six years, it was a completely changed. And uh, we, we would have got emails from the, from the, uh, the guy who had called down and sent them through. And I would sit in my room and watch players, what way they cross the ball, what, what would they take a free kick from or, or what. Where would they come inside? Would they cut inside and shoot? Uh, so the, the, the technology is there now to work more. So that's why I said before the friendship with the goalkeeping coach is the best. You need to have that now because basically you're 24 7 on the phone. You know what I mean? Mm. Trust me, you're on the phone. You're on the phone. Uh, if you're playing as a professional goalkeeping coach or in a, in a professional um, setup, you, you, you basically be on call for 24 7 because he's your player and anything will happen. Yeah, this is interesting. So you're you're an experienced goalkeeper. The technology comes into the game and you embrace it because it can make you better. But say there's a 23-year-old, 24-year-old goalkeeper who's just doesn't really want the information. So when you're a goalkeeper coach, do you try and educate that player on why the information is helpful or do you basically then custom your work to suit the goalkeeper? That's what comes back to you have to you have to understand what type of player you, uh, you're coaching because uh, some people might not want too much information before a game. You know what I mean? Uh, depends what you're coaching. You know what I mean? If you're coaching like what I'm doing, I'm coaching young kids. Uh, that's why I like coaching young kids because you, you can get them at the, at, the, at the start of the career and you can coach them, uh, coach them the basic stuff. What, what I was thought would do well for the young keepers coming up in the, up in Northern Ireland. But when you like, if I become a full-time coach and I'm in, in England, I'm in the Championship or the Premier League, you're going to have like 30-year-old goalkeepers who you can't coach them. All you can help uh, you, you coach them by training them on the ground uh, in the training ground. You can't change the technique. Uh, you can't do things like that. Do you know what I mean, Gary? That's the biggest thing. You have to you have to have a balance. Do you know what I mean? Slowly but surely, you can say, I think this could help you in the long term. Like I went to Greece, I learned completely a whole different technique in Greece, you know what I mean? Because I wanted, I was open-minded, because that's the type of person I was, I was an open-minded person. I've had 16, 17 goalkeeping coaches in my career. I picked up a lot of things from different coaches, but like I said to you when I was speaking in Baltimore, uh, the best coach I've ever had was the goalkeeping coach in Olympiagos, because we were we were very, very close, and uh, and we taught, we learned a lot. We had a, we had a few arguments, uh, because it was tough work, but when, when I left Olympia August, we, we still in touch, we still keep in touch because uh, we, we know what type of people we are. We're winners and we want to win things, and uh, and that's the that's where we were. And uh, and it's all about this. Everybody's got different opinions, but my opinion is uh, to 
depends what level you're coaching at. Um, it makes a big difference. If you're coaching 15 year olds, it's a big difference when you're coaching 27 year olds, 35 year olds. It's completely different because they've learned techniques, they've got their own techniques. So if you try and help them along, and, uh, and, and you can help them by introducing something else in the game, uh, uh, that's brilliant. I mean, that's the thing uh, what coaches have to think about now. You can't just go in the club and say, right, this is what we're going to do and this is what you have to do. That's what where life is now. You have to be patient. And uh, before, before you become a goalkeeper, you have to be friends with them first. You know what I mean? Something I've observed over here in the US is at the, at the pro level is that every time at half time the whistle goes and the goalkeeper coach is waiting for the goalkeeper to walk off the pitch with them and talk with them and again it, it might be similar to what you're saying it depends on the goalkeeper but when it comes to half time and you don't really you can't really work on anything and you can't really get video what, what's the role of that goalkeeper coach something i don't know I, sometimes i look at it like sometimes a coach might come on to me and Give me a slap around the head. No, I'm really joking because I'm letting go. No, I'm really joking. I'm really joking. No. Uh, see, I never had that because I never had that because uh, for me, the, the coach can't do nothing else. Uh, they, they work all week with you, and you come to a game on a Saturday. You can't change a game at half time. You know what I mean? Mm. If you, if you, it depends what happened that result. If it's if you win them two 0 and you made a good save, he comes up and gives you a pat on the back. That gives you another little boost. Do you know what I mean? But if you, if you let go and you're losing 3-0, then you'd be safer just stepping back and letting let go, let them come into the change rooms, let them, let them cool down and, and relax, you know what I mean? Because if you go in and say, like, you could have done this, you could have done that, it's just going to ruin them for the second half. So from my belief, as a coach, well, I'm, I'm, this is my new experience now coming into coaching, is uh, you've, done your, you've done your job during the week. You just you just watch the game and get the video uh, get the video sent out uh, sent out to the keeper probably on the Monday morning and show him uh, show him the good things he did and show him what the what the things he could improve on and that's the way things go in, in England anyhow because uh, they've got that technology now uh, even now you see I watched Manchester United and on the uh, under, I think it was on the 19th Champions League Champions League and uh, my good friend Alan Fettis he's the goalkeeping coach at Manchester United and uh, uh, the keeper let a goal in. Next minute, the manager uh, Nicky Buck turns around and uh, Alan Ferris is there with a big iPad, and it, they get they get the, the picture straight away. You see, you see if what the keeper's done wrong. So for me, um, it's just coming on at half time or putting arm around a keeper. You know, sometimes you might, sometimes a keeper might need that. So that's the same thing going back to the start what I said before. You have to know your goalkeepers before you can go any further, and uh, uh, sometimes you might. Me put an arm around the keeper and say, "Come on, you, uh, come on, you can, you can come out in the second half and improve. Let's try and do that in the second half." But for me personally, when I was playing as a keeper, I've ne- never had a, a goalkeeper coach that would come up to me at half time or even in the changing room and say anything to me. This this old old cliche that goalkeepers are mad. You've heard it a million times, but you know. I don't know where you get, <laughs> I don't know where you get that from. There I am. I'm, 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 a, I'm a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> but there's there's obviously there's a there's a great growth in in psychology support at youth levels today but it's it's basically delivered across the board to players i don't see it being tailored so much to to goalkeepers what's your thoughts is there a specific area mentally where clubs and sports psych specialists can help young goalkeepers yeah, I- And uh, they're going in games and they're losing quite heavily. And uh, they were saying to me, like, um, my kids were thinking about uh, moving away from the game. So I, I, for me, what I what I said to them, I said to them, bring them down to my uh, sc- uh, goalkeeping school uh, and uh, let them come in in five weeks and see. How, uh, and then he will understand with all the goalkeepers what's happening in, in this country. It's not just happening at one club. It's happening most of the clubs in Northern Ireland because they can't afford to bring coaches in, you see. So the main coach, goalkeeping coaches in, the high standard's not there for them because uh, the best goalkeeping coaches won't come to do it for nothing. And that's the truth. They won't mm-hmm. come and do it for nothing. Uh, that's the truth. Uh, I put my hands up. That's the truth. Like. And, uh, and I said, come down to come down to the school and see how, how the kid gets on for five weeks because for me, I we don't have enough goalkeepers in this country. So we, want, uh, I, we don't want to lose keepers. And uh, they come down and and understand what all the keepers are going through. So they're talking with all the keepers. So that's really where what we're do, what we're trying to get through the kids at the moment is like it happens all over the country. But are you hundred percent right? I, I do think kids need to understand the mental awareness of goalkeeper as well because it is a lonely it's a lonely place if you make a mistake. It is a lonely place, trust me, I've been there. I've been there, it's a horrible feeling. Mm. But 
I tell the kids, I my first time I played for Balamala, they were playing in Dondella against uh, up in Belfast. People in America won't understand how he fought <laughs> the manor. As soon as he sent me miles, but not many scouts would have came down and fought this to the county of the manor. So I moved up, I played for Balamala up in Dondella, lost the game 5 2. A scout came up to me and said, Roy, we want you to come for the trials at Home City. I've let five goals and I was thinking, is this guy having a laugh? You know what I mean? So I'm trying to tell the kids, it's not it's not how many goals you let in, it's how you perform and how you your attitude towards a goal that does go in. That's what people are looking for in this day and age. Um and never never put your head down. I'm not I'm not I try my best to help these kids, but hundred percent right to do to do to do a lot for I think players, but I think they have to do more for goalkeepers. Uh, because you you make a mistake as a goal, strike a miss, uh, strike miss five shots and score the score one goal and win win the game. He's the hero. But if we let a goal in uh, and we lose one 0 we're, we're the worst we're, we're the worst person in the world. I was so bad at this as a head coach in college, and only reflecting on it now to be I didn't I, I suppose didn't see it from the goalkeeper's perspective and didn't really give them the the, the right amount of support and time. So. I think as a head coach, it can be difficult. And I, I wanted to ask, you mentioned Alex Ferguson before. Was there a manager who basically you felt understood or at least had empathy towards the goalkeepers the best? See, see the thing, so Alex, he, he told you straight, the face, you know what I mean? Some managers don't do it. So Alex Ferguson, he, he tells you straight in the face if you play it or not, you know what I mean? No. Uh, probably the day before, whatever, the day before. I remember, I remember the time when it was playing against Austin. Bartes could play, couldn't he?
end of the day, I always say, as long as you keep that ball out of the back of the net, and that's the big thing. We, we can we can get carried away, and the, my worst thing when I look at goalkeeping now is the the, the crossing has gone out of the game. The goalkeepers don't dominate the six yard box, don't dominate the eighteen yard box, and that's what I would like to see keepers dom- dominate and come for crosses. I know the balls are lighter and quicker, but keepers are getting faster and quicker as well. So uh, why not? That's for another show, mate. Yeah, that's, that's another. for another one. <laughs> stay on, stay on the United culture because it's obviously, especially in America, you know, we we've, we've got to expose the books and Sir Alex Ferguson's le- legacy. Coaches know a lot about it, but I've always read that it was a player-driven culture when it got up and running, and you joined at a time when it was really, really established. So I wanted to get your thoughts on. Those daily standards that the players drove. How was that done? Well, when I when I first joined uh, United, it was I was nervous. I signed a contract three weeks before. I had to go in, and I was like, "Can you sleep for three weeks?" I didn't want to say to the players. These guys are superstars. You know what I mean? Superstars. And uh, I just turned up the train, and I was there an hour and a half before everybody else because we wanted to get in and be prepared. What we wanted to say to the boys, but uh, the players. Normal people and came in and shook my hand and welcomed me. It made me feel really welcome. But what you were saying there, the player, the players give themselves motivation, not being motivated. If, if, if someone's not pulling the weight, another senior player would pull them aside and say, Come on, you have to keep right, work harder. And that's why Manchester United was so successful in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, because uh, you had players like Roy Keane, you had players like Gary Neville, you had players like David Beckham. Just take a quick break here to keep up with Nemesis training, individual groups and camp schedule or to purchase NGA Glove brand. Please visit their website at www.nemesisgoalkeeping.com. You can also follow them on social media, Facebook at N Goalkeeping and NGA Iowa Goalkeeping, Instagram Nemesis under slash goalkeeping and NGA under slash soccer under slash iowa and then twitter at nemesis gk and at no goals against thanks so much for them for sponsoring the podcast please check out nemesis goalkeeping back to roy apologies because you've probably got this question at least a thousand times but uh, I wonder what one <laughs> standing behind roy keen in the tunnel oh, that one, I think <laughs> <laughs> you don't look bothered. I I watched it again yesterday. Like you don't seem bothered at all. So was that something that you saw regularly, or was this your focus on the game? Personally, for me, it was just I was focused on night, but uh, I did I did understand what was happening, and what was going on around me. And uh, but Roy Keane, he's I always say I do I do a lot of talks and stuff, and uh, Roy Keane, he was our, he was our engine, and he was our leader. And uh, I've always said this, I always said that uh, that tunnel got matches now whether they're not game because mm. we were so motivated after what Roy Keane did. If you have your captain coming back the whole way back to the tunnel to help your one of your teammates uh, because of Patrick Vieira, that uh, gives you a lift, it gives you a lift. Like, and 
and showed who we it was a great game that I was working Arsenal in them days in the early mid two thousand. Arsenal mind you, it would be hatred to win games and of course like you do anything to win the game and that was the truth. I don't care, like, you know what I mean? If you go out and you want to win that game, we were, I think it was four two that ended up, you know what I mean? It was some game. And uh, them games them games in the past, like I don't think you'll ever get them games again. Especially at Highbury when it was really small ground and everybody was so close in the tunnel couldn't even swing a cat in it because it was that small. I read that you you made a decision to leave United because you wanted to be number one, and we don't really talk about this, so there's not a lot of uh, reading on it. On, on number twos, it's a difficult role whenever you're not the number one, and it's obviously you mentioned they're coming on the cup final, but there's not a, there's never subs. No one ever subs on the goalkeeper to get a game, rarely, unless there's an injury. So, how can clubs help their number twos, or is it just a case of you just need the matches. No, they say, that's the thing. When I left Manchester United, um, I left Manchester United because I knew it was going to be harder because uh, um, they were bringing another keeper in. But see that, what I said there, number one, I want to be a number one. Like, I look back now and say, there's, there's not a number one, not a number one in, in, in the game because end of the day, there's always someone behind you trying to push you and get you get your spot. Like, and you have to work every day. You know what I mean? You have to work hard. Me, you're a goalkeeper, you, 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 end up, you end the team then, you have to keep your spot, you know what I mean? That's the thing that we try and do. And I went to West Ham, no one was going to start the season, uh, because uh, I'll apologise, I bought me in, I knew it was going to start, but uh, if you don't play well, you're going to be dropped, you know what I mean? Uh, so the thing what you're saying there, number one, number two is right, okay, we go down that route, number one, number two. But uh, it's hard to be a number two, is right, it's very hard to be the sub-keeper, because... Uh, deep down, you don't want anything to happen because you want the team to do well. But even deeper down, you do want something to happen because you want to get a game time. And that's me talking to the tr- talk the truth because everybody deep down wants to play a game of football. If not, there's something wrong with you. Yeah, there's something that's not quite there's something wrong if you don't want to play uh, play the game. And um, when uh, when I was told uh, to bring another keeper, I could stay in Manchester United for another four years. So Alex offered me another four years, but. Um, I had a lot of talk with uh, a lot of senior players at Manchester United, especially with Roy Keane, and we talked, and, and uh, I looked back and said, uh, what, what am I going to do? I'm going to sit on the bench for the next four years, or sit at the stands for the next four years, or I might get a couple of games in the, in, in the next four years. I'm not that type of person, you know what I mean? I'm from Northern Ireland, and I always, my dream was to be a professional footballer and play as many games as I can, and, uh, and I decided to move on to West Ham, and... Um, I don't look back and say I wish this stayed because at the end of the day, I won the Premier League and uh, I, I, I was in the FA Cup, uh, was in the FA Cup final two times. Like so, mm. I enjoyed my time at Manchester United. I learned a lot. I learned a lot from the best players in the world and the best manager in the world. So uh, hopefully, I can pass that on my knowledge, the knowledge I've learned over my career to the to the young players that are coming through now. You finished your playing career back in Northern Ireland, and I wanted to get your thoughts on. How has the football or the culture, football culture, changed since since when you left there to sign with Hull City twenty years before it? I tell you, when I first came home, um, not many people know this, like, but when I first came home, I struggled. I struggled for the first four months coming back home, like, because it was part time football training. Okay, it was part time, but we were training three times a week. The manager might give me up the uh, up the off, and I come in Tuesday and Thursday training. Um, but I coming from a professional background coming into a part-time uh, situation was very difficult uh, but I got I got over it um, it took me a while to get over it got used to training twice a week but I done my own training as well you see so I kept myself focused and um, but the thing is in the, the Irish League it's, it's it's changing as well like you have a look at I uh, don't know if you ever watched the Irish League now you've know, been living up there for quite a while now mm. mate, but we're having full-time football now there's teams over here are full-time getting full-time training so it is slowly changing but it's still that standard of football which is very very tough it's, it's i can home with an open mind knowing this league is going to be a hard league because it's on the mile an hour the lower the lower the lower you go it's a lot harder for keepers because um the standard players don't understand the game as much i don't mean this disrespectful but players will run more into the keeper than they do in the higher league because when i played in national football ball would be passed back to me, centre-half passed the ball back, the striker would never run into me, 
they were just holding the line and let me play off the ball and try and get the ball out past them. But in the Irish League, they would just run, down, run you down until until the legs just give up. You know what I mean? And you don't have time to pass. You don't have time to pass the ball as much as you do in the higher league. And uh, that's that's the other thing when you're coaching. Uh, you're coaching keepers now to play off the feet. Uh, uh, a lot, but what standards are they going to make it? You know what I mean? Are they going to make uh, a high league? You're pushing them to play in the highest league you can. So you're going to coach them the same way what you're going to be coaching a Premier League keeper. But then you have to realise they have to learn their own way. And so they have to adopt themselves. I can't do this. I can't play out from the back. And then the pitches are not the best over here in the winter. That's the other thing, you know what I mean? But the, uh, the culture, the culture uh, Irish League football is changing a little bit because the all teams going full time now. They talk about Clinton going full time. Lon, who has been brought up uh, a guy from America, but he's from Lisbon. Mm-hmm. He's from Lon, and he's at full time. Crusaders gone full time. Then Phil's probably going to go full time as well. So there's four or five teams who are going to go full time football, which is going to be good, good for the country, I think. Better for the younger players who's going to uh, compete in the Irish League. But uh, for me, if an Irish League player who's 16, 17, 18 years old is good enough, they're going to end up going across the water anyhow to England or Scotland or even mainland uh, Europe because the way things are going in England at the moment, Gary, is. Uh, is uh, there's a lot of foreign players coming in the British British football, which is pushing the British players further afield, like Germany and Spain and Holland. It'll be interesting in the next five or ten years what's going to happen in Irish League football. Uh, last couple for you. Descri- yeah. Describe yourself as a goalkeeper coach. Mental? No, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only I'm only kidding. No. Uh, like I said before, yeah, open mind. You have to be open minded. Uh, passion. Uh, and you have to you have to have energy. That's the main thing. Energy. You have to have an open mind. And open mind is important one because you have to understand what these kids. Uh, everybody comes back from a different background, and that's what I'm coaching at the moment. I'm coaching kids between nine and sixteen year olds. So uh, that's what I'm coaching at the moment. And uh, uh, that's the three things I think what, to make a, a coach uh, my coach. Uh, brilliant. That's what I believe. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, best player played with. Oh man, <laughs> how many can I? How many can I? Nah, um, I've played with a lot of different players, a lot of good players. I played, I played with Ronaldo, uh, who came through as a young lad, and the talent he had was unbelievable. What a talent he had at a young age! What he did on the training ground, he, he did it on the on the pitch. But the best, uh, the best person and player I played with at Manchester United probably would have been. No disrespect to everybody else, but I like Paul Scholes as a player because mm. he knew what was going to happen before he got the ball to his feet. He, he was like two phases in front of everybody else. He knew what the pass was going to be when he had it before the ball even came to his feet. He scored goals. He scored goals as well. He scored a lot of goals from attacking the uh, attacking there. But I don't want to put down beat more teammates at Man U, but everybody was unbelievable. Yeah. Paul Scholes, Paul Scholes were... The only, the only thing I could have said about Paul Scholes, he could have learned how to tackle a bit better. <laughs> his, tackling, his tackling, he wasn't the best at tackling, but uh, yeah, everything else he was, he was excellent with. This Ronaldo work ethic that he's so famous for, was that, did you see signs of that when he first came? Oh, big time, big time. I, I spoke to quite a few people about it, like, and, and I was in, uh, there's, there's a, uh, a thing over here called Club and I in Northern Ireland this is for the future of Northern Ireland players and uh, it's to help them to get across uh, uh, abroad to uh, clubs in England and Scotland or uh, maybe further afield in Europe and uh, I went to West Ham with the 14 group and uh, I said to them uh, what's your ambition who do you want to what do you want to do in life as a, a, a professional footballer if you, if you make it I want to be like Ronaldo and I said to them I wish someone could have videoed Ronaldo when he first came to Manchester United the whole way to be even horrendous and show people how hard he had to work for to get the way he is today. He worked so hard to be where he is today. And, it, and he was in the gym every single day. He was doing his feet work, he was doing his ball work, he was doing his free kick work. And uh, it wasn't just two hours. On the, it wasn't just two hours. You're talking about four, five, six, seven hours a day. He was working on his, on his, on his, on his, on his uh, football career. And that's why... He, that's why he is, and that's why he's still playing the highest level, 34, 33, 34, I think mm. he is now. And, uh, and it's scary what people say, I want to be a professional footballer, but don't want to put the hard work into it, you know what I mean? It's all about hard work. Um, a building you can get you as far as you uh, uh, can get you far, but you have to work, you have to, if you want to go further, you have to work hard as well. Mm. And uh, Ronaldo, Ronaldo had that, he had that, he came over, he came over from Sporting Lisbon, like, uh, we were, we had a, we were uh, touring around America.
striker, and we stopped off the sport in Lisbon, the first sport in Lisbon, and this young man was just unbelievable with all the players and saying how good he was. And three weeks later, he came to Manchester United, couldn't speak a word of English. After two or three months, he was speaking broken English, and he worked hard on his English, and he, it, it just proves that if you have the work, uh, if you have the work ability, you can go a long way in the game. And he has the skill; he always had the skill. But that's why he's that's why he's been playing. That's why he's been playing at the highest level for, well, for so many, for so long, and so long. I think he still has it. He could play for another two or three years because he's he's just a, he's just a machine. He had to change his game a bit. It wasn't easy at United as well when he arrived. No, oh, so, uh, United. You have to work. You work hard. Uh, when players came to Manchester United, it was a different type of football. Uh, strikers had to work back and run and run it all over. You go, you go there. You go to Spain. Strikers uh, normally just stay up, stay up the front line. Uh, you come to Man- you come to England. You have to work hard. It's working. You're working hard. You know what I mean. You mm. could be doing about nine. You could be doing about nine ten. Miles in a game uh, when you come to England, and uh, Ronaldo had to change a lot in his lifestyle, and he did. He did, and, and it's great honor. It was great honor to play with him, and uh, it's great to see him, and, and great to see. Him. I played against him when I was playing for Northern Ireland against Portugal, and you know, you know what? I'd never seen him for ten years, and he came up to me and he shook my hand, and we were talking like we have. And he met the day, uh, the, uh, we were talking the day before, but he, he's that type of guy. He's a down there earth guy, and. Uh, He's one of the best uh, out there as well, and uh, everybody says to me Ronaldo and Messi, but both of both them's great players. But for me, I played for Ronaldo, and I knew what Ronaldo went through, and, uh, and how hard he worked to get where he did. And Messi did the same thing because uh, I've read a few books about Messi, and he worked hard as well to get the way he was. So mm. everybody said Ronaldo and Messi were great players, but they had the work, and the people out there need to know that. Uh, uh, you have to work to. Roy, thank you so much. This was amazing. Really enjoyed it. No problem at all, hey. Uh, 45 minutes that was. That was a long talk. I didn't realise it was that long. <laughs> it flies, <laughs> doesn't it? I know, I know, mate. Yeah. I just go on. I just love talking about uh, goalkeeping and football. Uh-huh. That's my life. My life. But it was nice, nice to be on your podcast and it was really nice and hopefully you'll be back in America someday. Uh, I really enjoyed myself in Baltimore. Brilliant. Hopefully, fingers crossed. I'll be back over to see a few more people. Thanks so much to Roy for his time and his insight there. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Loved it, loved it. Um, definitely not a goalkeeper expert and always say that whenever we bring a goalkeeper coach or a goalkeeper onto the show. But I do enjoy, as Raddy at the Red Stars would definitely confirm, I do enjoy a good debate or an argument or a discussion about goalkeeping and I do find it fascinating as we are more aware and as we get more information how we build our environment and how we work alongside our goalkeeper coach our goalkeeping staff our playing philosophy the club philosophy i think it's becoming more and more important and i think that changes that was the interesting thing for me in roy's conversation is that changes as the goalkeeper changes so the type of work you do as a young goalkeeper maybe more technical driven and then the work that you do as you get older into the professional game maybe more scouting driven and then the psychological part changes slightly with pressure but you can see that's always under the surface it's always there the psychological part is so big so i think how the goalkeeper is changing it was really really interesting but i think the most impressive thing for the interview was how Roy's approach to getting better and his approach to the profession. You can see how how passionately he talks about the game, but also how much he talks about getting better and how much he learned from all those different environments. And he said, you know, still getting better at Olympiacos and still looking to get better even when he went to Linfield. I think it's really, really important. And, and sometimes we think of development as a destination process when we're even at the youth level when we're looking at saying all right what does this player need to become and and that can change every year and it can keep changing and i think that's the beauty of any position not just goalkeeping i think it's the 
the drive to get better, the willingness to be open-minded, and I think that's a great message to send. So if you reverse engineer it as, as a coaching community, you know, how do we, I suppose, grow that in young players, goalkeepers and outfield players? I suppose it's just how we talk about the game and how we keep putting little things in their heads to try and make them more, more curious about it. Uh, with the video work, with the training work, with a little bit of psychology. Roy mentioned there about the goalkeepers that he works with in Northern Ireland, about support network and helping each other out. And I think that is so, so important. So even though it was all about goalkeepers, I got a lot out of it about you know, how we're building environments. And even for different positions, I think that's going to become a, a huge thing as well in the future is, all right, well, how are we going to develop players who just want to get better in every position? So yeah, really, really enjoyed it. Big thanks to Roy for coming on and we'd love to hear your thoughts on it at Gary Kernin on Twitter, at Gary Kernin on Instagram. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast. Webinar coming on the Modern Soccer Coach platform very, very soon. So please check that out. Thanks again for all your support. Have a great week. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to the Modern Soccer Coach podcast. For more coaching topics, sessions, and resources, Head on over to Coach Kernine on Facebook or visit the website at www.modernsoccercoach.com.